All righty. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to the sixth installment of Doc and Caveman's NBA Draft Profiles. Today, we're going to be talking about A.J. Griffin. My name is Dr. Fantasy, and as always, I'm here with my partner, the Fantasy Caveman. Partner in crime, by the way. I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. Um, <laughs> or do we want them to get the wrong idea? Oh, gosh. Okay, I'm moving on from that. Um, talking about A.J. Griffin today from Duke. Freshman last year, 6'6", 222 pounds. Last year, averaged 10.5 points, almost four rebounds. He did have a knee injury at the beginning of the season, which held him back. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit as we move along. But what are your initial thoughts on A.J. Griffin? He actually is the son of formal, former NBA player Adrian Griffin. This is actually Adrian Griffin Jr. So um, it's got some NBA bloodlines there. But Caveman, what are your initial thoughts, strengths on A.J. Griffin? Uh, I mean, and we'll talk, we'll talk, um, yeah, we'll talk about the injury as it goes at the, that knee injury as it go as we go on. But, uh, I mean, the first thing that stands out, I mean, you, you, I don't know if you mentioned, you mentioned his percentages, but he shot, he was nearly a 45% three point shooter. Uh, and I'm a decent, I'm some, I'm a solid four attempts a game. So that's, that's what I look at. I was like, okay. Is let's say a guy is shooting 45, 46 percent from three, but they're only taking two attempts a game or something like that, you know. But so it's like pretty good percentage with some solid volume. Uh, I think, I think that they, I think he has a lot more potential than what he was able to show in college. Uh, uh, especially with being able to create his own shot, I really think he, I really think that can become a strength of his. Uh, now you know, it's hard to really showcase your true abilities. Uh, when you play for Duke, <laughs> because you have, I mean, I mean, we already talked about, well, you know, out of this, these six, this is our sixth profile that we've done. Two of them have been from Duke, so I mean he had to. He definitely had. He had to share some uh, spotlight with Paulo, uh, and then I think that the injury also kind of hampered uh, him and real being able to show off some of the that uh, his strengths. And then the final thing I want to mention is that when we're talking about now, a lot of the NBA is okay. There's one ball. So four guys are moving without the ball. There's one guy having the ball. That's how that works. I'm, I'm correct, right? I There's think so, but let me double check. One ball, four guys are moving without the ball. When it comes to moving without the ball, I think AJ Griffin is the best is, is the best at that in this draft class. Uh, I think a lot of times you see guys get kind of lost and not really know what to do. When they don't have the ball in their hands, that's not AJ Griffin. He will. He knows how to move without the ball. I think he's good. At, he's a good cutter. He just. I, I I love a guy that knows what to do when he doesn't have the ball, and he knows what to do when he doesn't have the ball. Yeah, I mean. I don't know if there's much debating it, but he's the best three-point shooter in this class. I think we just got to throw that out there. Uh, I mean, when you're yeah. shooting that high of a percentage, I, I mean, I can't see how there would be a better three-point shooter in this class unless somebody's shooting 50% from three, which is insane. So, I mean, he's one of the best three-point shooters in this class. When you have that ability just right from the get-go in today's NBA game, you're going to be one of the top prospects in the draft. Yeah. That's just how it is. Um, is this going to be like Aaron Neesmith one time? That didn't Aaron work Neesmith. Out. <laughs> Shout out to Aaron Neesmith. But, um, yeah, I mean, he's probably the best three-point shooter in this class, and he's got the unique ability to be able to create that three-point shot himself and play yep. off the ball. You know, you mentioned him being great off the ball, which, of course, is a fantastic skill. But when he does have the ball in his hand, he can be creative in creating yeah. that. So, uh, the, the, he's system got, really struck, 
the system they run at Duke made it kind of difficult for him to really showcase that ability to create his own shot. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't get a huge opportunity. If you go back, and I know a lot of people, he's one of those, he was very very highly touted coming out of high school, obviously going to Duke, but um, that was one of his big selling points for a lot of teams that were looking at recruiting him was that his, his shot creation ability. So definitely didn't get to do it as much at Duke, but he's shown that ability previously. Um I mean, and when we talk about a lot, that's why I actually struggled to come up with a good comparison for him. When we talk about a lot of the elite shooters or elite three-point shooters in today's game, there's not many that kind of have his size, you know, to be 6'6", 200 and almost 25 pounds. I mean, he's got a really good size, and I think that's a big strength of his. He uses it to when he does get to the rim, he has all the ability in the world to finish. And I think when you look at his offensive game as a whole, it's fairly complete. He doesn't have mm -hmm. too many holes in his offensive game. And that's one of those things. I could see him rising up draft boards pretty quickly. I saw him pretty consistently because of the injuries going outside the top 10. But when you have a complete offensive profile, that's a guy that can start sneaking into the top five. We talked before about having a clear top four. I don't think there's any reason that he can't be that fifth player coming off the board based off of his offensive ability and potential. Oh, yeah, he could definitely be outside. Yeah, I agree. So what about defensively? Um, <laughs> is Go ahead, K-Man, you go first. <laughs> there, is a B in my, there is a B in my apartment. I'm not. I'm not enjoying oh, that you have right a now. Friend. That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, you mentioned kicked off with the defense. I mean, the thing is, what's what's really struggling about him is you have to really look at him and really take into consideration how much that knee injury affected him. Because uh, I really think it was at least early on when he was first coming. I think it really hampered him quite a bit and really took away some of his ability that he wasn't able to uh, show off. I think he's a guy where if he was 100% last season and he didn't have any knee injury, I I think this guy is in consideration for number one pick. Uh, I think I think that's where we're at with him, but I think the knee, I, I, the knee injury kind of has, has hampered him a little bit. Uh, so how much of his lapses on the defensive end are due to the in, are due to the injury, uh, and how much of it is him, like half the other prospects we talked about, is a is an effort thing. So I think that's that's the what 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 do you what do you think what do you think about his overall? Is it how much is the injury, then how much of his just overall just effort inconsistency? Yeah, that's what I find really interesting is depending on what scouting report you're looking at and depending on what highlight reel you're looking at, some people have him pegged as a really good defender and some people have him pegged as below average. So I think the jury is still out because I think if you're looking at a lot of what he displayed in high school is he was a above average, if not not an elite, but he was an above average defender and showed a lot of two way ability. So I tend to think that it potentially could be the injury. And when you're hampered by that, and you know, he had a lot on the line last year to where, I don't know how much he pushed himself to get in there and play, but you know, he has his NBA career in stock on the line. So you want to get out there and show scouts at the next level what you have so you know I don't know how much of it is that but I actually as much as I don't like making excuses for guys I feel like it could be that because he showed flashes in college but not at the consistent level that he did in high school and I think the jury is still I don't think we can say either way if we go in you know two years in the NBA and he's still not showing effort okay it's probably not the injury anymore but he's shown it in the past so I think the jury is still out on it personally and that's an interesting equation to this all of a sudden if I told you he was an above average defender I mean we are talking about a guy that's in contention for the number one overall pick and that's why I would probably 
strongly have him as my number five prospect in this year's class. And I would take mm-hmm. a chance on him at five, especially if I have had confidence in my coaching and uh, the ability to put him in a good defensive system. And if mm-hmm. I had a good playmaker already established, uh, I, I think that he would be a great secondary piece for somebody. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah, yeah I don't have a, anything else on yeah. the weakness side? I don't really no, have anything. Yeah. No, I, th- I think we pretty much uh, touch base on What do you have stuff. for uh, ideal fits then? Okay. I, I'm going to say it before you can say it, and I'm just going to say the thunder. I'm going to just say I'm, I'm going to say it before because I'm pretty sure you were going to say them too. You always say uh, them. <laughs> But he's just, I mean, to give a guy like Shy or Giddy when, you know, when they give, it seems like when they give Shy a break, then Giddy can handle the ball as well. The, for, for, to give them a knockdown three-point shooter like Griffin, I mean, that just opens up so many things up for him. And you look at the Thunder, do they have a knockdown three-point shooter on their team? Mm, not really. Can you name the best three-point... Can you name the best three-point shooter on the Thunder last season? Was it... Was it, was it Dort? I, I, I don't Probably. know. But just give, it, give them a guy like... A uh, guy like Griffin who... I... I believe that Griffin has superstar potential in him. Uh, the three-point ability combined with if the injury was a large part of why he wasn't as effective defensively, I mean, if that if that heals 100 and he, his, his injury is 100% and he, and he gets back to playing that defense, like you said, that he showed flashes of in college, I mean, not in college, but in high school, I mean, we're talking, we're definitely talking superstar potential with him. And, uh, I mean... I, I'm with you. I think if I'm putting together, if I'm putting together my own big board, I'm strongly considering him just outside the top four uh, at, at number five. And like, I don't think it would be an extremely crazy reach if he were to knock one of those top four guys out. If we're being honest, uh, so I think he has that kind of a, uh, ability. So the Thunder. I also threw uh, the Pelicans out there. First time we've said their name today. For, uh, I think I just thank him. I just think the Pelicans they need. They, Zion. I don't. Nobody knows what's going on with Zion anymore. I don't even know. Was, will we see Zion playing another NBA game? I don't know. Isn't that uh, crazy? That's even a question. <laughs> That is crazy. That's that's the question. But like, again, I think I think AJ Griffin uh, would go into New Orleans, fit right in. I mean, they have Zion, and they have they have Ingram, they have uh, Ingram there. But you give them a guy like Griffin, who his floor is a guy that is going to come in off the bench and give you instant three pointers. At, at a good size, I think that is as far. So, a team like the Pelicans for me, who could use some offensive punch, uh, makes sense. Yeah, and I mentioned a few of these teams. I had the Pelicans on there as well. That's been a huge focus of theirs. Two years ago, they were one of the worst three-point shooting teams in the entire league. Last year, they showed a lot of improvement and I think that's going to continue to be an area of focus for them I mean I think the point of that was more surrounding Zion with shooters so maybe that plan is changing but I still think the point of the matter is they're not the strongest three-point shooting team and he provided some upside and almost an insurance policy if Zion's not able to come back because they have another guy with superstar potential um, potentially so I had New Orleans as one. I had the Kings there as well. I mentioned them with Keegan Murray as well. I think they could use another strong three-point shooter. Um, You know, that's another team where they wouldn't have to rely on A.J. Griffin having the ball in his hands a ton. 
And then another team who's going to be in the mix for even potentially a top five pick because they were so bad last year. And I'm really interested to see what they do with it. But that is the Indiana Pacers, who I don't know. Have we mentioned the Pacers at all today? I, 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 so. I, I, I mentioned them in the uh, I mentioned them in the last episode briefly. But yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see where they go with their pick. So as of right now, they have the fifth best odds to get the first or the first overall pick. So they're looking at a potential first or a top five pick. And when you look at their depth chart, no idea what they're going to do with that, honestly. I mean, they're still one of those teams where their depth chart doesn't look terrible. They should be a playoff. Huh. I don't know what goes yeah, on with this team I, every I year. Think we're, I, think we, I, think we, I think we beat a dead horse pretty thoroughly with the Indiana Pacers. I mean, I still I will never understand this. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think a guy like Griffin and Keegan Murray, too, would probably fit in pretty well. Theoretically, they should just need a, uh, a put-together, refined piece like Keegan Murray. But, I'll throw them into the mix for um, for AJ Griffin as well. So okay, let's go over to NBA comparisons. Who do you have? This one's very tough for. I don't know why this was the hardest one for me. So I don't think I have a good one. Uh, I mean, and you mentioned his name. I don't know if you mentioned him this episode yet, but the really the only like good name that comes to mind for me is Desmond Bain. Uh, I mean, you look at Desmond Bain, I mean, what he did uh, this past season, I mean, you're talking about a guy that he averaged 18 points, four rebounds, I mean, two, just almost three assists, shot, Desmond Bain shot 40, almost 44% from three this season. I think this is a stat line that you can easily kind of see from AJ AJ Griffin kind of you know John Morant not being the best uh three point shooter I think Desmond Bain was really if you think about it, Desmond Bain was one of, easily one of their more consistent guys from three point range this season I think you can come in I think uh AJ Griffin could come in kind of fill that Desmond Bain role that Desmond Bain filled for uh the Grizzlies this season. Yeah, I mean, I came across that name. I'm not sure, honestly, how I feel about that one, <laughs> just because I feel like he has more upside than that. Um, okay. If he's able to develop into a two-way player, I'm going to throw out kind of a, a weird one that I haven't seen, but I see a little bit of, uh, I guess, I don't know, I have trouble with this one, but I see a little bit of Andrew Wiggins, I guess. And I think we have to start getting to the point where when we hear Andrew Wiggins, we think about <laughs> superstar. That's just the reality. But when you look at a great three and D kind of player, that's what Andrew Wiggins is. And he's been a top option on one of the best teams in the league this year. So, you know, you're talking about a guy like Griffin, who I think if he had a career like that, it would be overall pretty successful for him. Yeah. The other one that I ran into a few times was um, Robert Covington, another good 3 and D player. Um, I think that yeah. that once again, it's similar to Desmond Bain. I don't think that gives him enough credit for the upside that he has. Personally. Yeah, Robert, uh, yeah, the thing, we, we, I think uh, the thing is like, I think the thing is, I think he has the potential to be Robert Covington at defensive end uh, for sure. We need to, Again, a lot of, I mean, a lot of comparisons also come down to, you know, that, that need, that, that injury, if it's, if it's going to hamper him all at all at the next level, like it did in college, you know, this is, that's definitely going to be something that's going to prevent him, you know, from being compared to, you know, some of the, the grace. You notice how we didn't, and this is what's tough. This is what for me was really tough with getting a good comparison for him. Is you know we don't know how he's really going to look if his injury is hundred percent. Like we're 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 we 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 do not have. I don't have an elite comparison for him because I just don't know how he's gonna look. You know, 
you know, coming into the the NBA with that with that injury. So I mean, I want maybe maybe after maybe after his first year, I'll have some elite comparisons for him. Okay. Yeah, I think the best one probably it's not even elite, but. I think uh, what R.J. Barrett's done is pretty similar, too. I mean, he's 40% from three. Uh, he averaged 20 points last year, too. So, I mean, he's been a That's really good point. defender. So, I think that could be a pretty fair comparison for him, yeah. too. Um, okay. Anything else you want to – I think, yeah, it's just a good point to make with him. I struggled with him the most because I like him, but I think there's a lot of question marks. And I think whoever takes a chance on him – is taking a big gamble because they could be getting the number one player in the class potentially. Cause I mean, if he lived up to it, he really could be that level of player or you're looking at a guy that's never able to, you know, put together a full season. He misses games every year and you know, it, it never fully puts it together. Yeah, so it's you're, 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 thing, yeah. huge gamble. Yeah. Cause it's not going to be like how like you're going to, if the if this injury is that bad, you're going to see him miss games at the NBA level. So it, it is worth not. noting too that he did miss some games in high school due to um, lower body injuries as well. That's, so that screams that 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 kind of that that kind of screams Michael Porter Jr. a little bit. Yeah, I mean it's one yeah. of those things where if he lives up to it fifth player off the board if he doesn't or you know I think a lot of it will come down to how his medicals look when team doctors are evaluating him if those don't come back overly clean and people aren't confident in it we Michael Porter went, slide, like 14th yeah, I think it was. when I think 14th yeah 13 14th something I like that so you can see, yep Griffin in that range so, yeah, that'll be interesting because I mean, that's a pretty big range when you start getting into the top players. If you're like, eh, I don't know, this guy could go anywhere from 5 to 14. That's a pretty significant range because typically you have a decent idea of the top 10 players, I'd say. Like, we know the top four, but then we don't know after that. Yeah, so. And there's a lot of talent. I think that's why it's tough. It's not a year where you're like... I can't decide who's going to go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten because there's no talent. It's almost that there's a lot of talent, so you can't decide and how to you, order them. And you, you know how it goes. We're going to be shocked, and one of our one of our guys that are in the top four is going to end up sliding to like tenth or some shit. Something, I something like that that's going to that's going something like that's going to happen. Where you know, I mean. Yeah, I don't know. I think overall last year, thinking back on it, I don't think there's anything surprising in the top 10, except top 10, top <laughs> except 10. maybe <laughs> maybe Josh Giddy. Josh Giddy, would he end up going fourth, fifth? Yeah, something like that. I think I, I, did, I'm up. Did I have that? I, I, I'd have to look back on mine by then, but. Six. Yeah. This is going to be. When when we we're in we're only six we're only now this we're only six guys in, but this is gonna be a very it, when, when we do our mock drafts after the top four it's going this is gonna be a very interesting. If I get one right after the top four, I'll be happy. <laughs> All right. Being very optimistic too. So okay, I think that's it here. Um, we haven't come up with our list for the next few yet, so I don't know off the top of my head who the next few ones are going to be. I'm, I'm, but pretty, I'm pretty sure. I, I think Johnny Davis might be in there from Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, probably Johnny Davis. Ty Ty Washington's probably in that range, too, I'd yeah. assume. So um, we'll be covering some of those guys next. We're starting to get to the back half of the top 10, so we'll have your guys that are going to be going probably somewhere in the 5 to 15 range here coming up soon. So make sure you guys keep an eye out for that, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.